This is a story of a woman named Adelaide McHugh who went from selling candy to selling art made by people who would become famous artists and very important. She was a rock star gallerist. Hi there, my name is Miss Emma and I am coming to you from the Crawford Art Museum. I'm not alone here, my friends Halton Kinsman, Brian Sir, and Mallory Marsh are in the gallery with me. I'm kind of um, distracted and laughing a little bit. This is a very, very incredibly engaging exhibit. I really enjoy it and love it. Uh, it's called the Candy Store Funk, Nut and Other Art with a Kick. Now, for uh, everyone who's associated with Candy Store Gallery, which was the name of Adeliza McHugh's gallery, is very, very pleased to see this artwork. And many of the artists who uh, have come to see it have understood and reminisced about this incredible gallery. Let me tell, me, you, tell you a little bit more about this rock star gallerist. Let's walk and chat. So I keep saying this word galleries. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, a gallery owner uh, is a person that owns an art gallery. And the purpose of this art gallery is to work with artists to show their work and to sell their work. Uh, Adeliza McHugh was like no other. She was in business for 30 years. And these 30 years, were very vibrant, and uh, every uh, artist that worked with her uh, knew her to be someone they could trust, and they really, really liked her and considered her an ally, and when she hyped their work, she was also hyping our region. And this is another reason why we respect and appreciate Adeliza McHugh. She is credited in part for establishing this entire region as an art center of international importance. Uh, I do wish that I could touch upon the career of every artist in this uh, exhibition. I can't, we can only, only talk about a few. Uh, and that is why I really, really encourage everyone to come to the museum and see this exhibit. Now, <clears throat> as you look around behind me, and my friend Houghton is uh, showing you a little bit of this exhibition, I wanted you to know that I work in this museum, and I see all this artwork, and I'm like a kid in a candy store. Literally, that title is really resonating with me because the way that I enjoy art, I love all types of art, I really don't have a favorite, but what do I do? Where do I go? What do I look at first? Well, I just relax. I might browse and look around the gallery, walk around it a couple of times. And when I see some artwork that makes me curious, I stop and I spend time with that artwork. So I want to invite you to spend some time with me in an artwork. And I'm hoping that some of you have the chat capability and will be able to interact with those of us here. My friend Mallory Marsh is going to have that chat and she will be relaying any kind of communication that you have for me to me. So, you're a bunch of teachers here, I hope. So, notes. So if you hear a paper flipping, that's me and my notes. I don't wanna miss telling you important information about the artists and about Adeliza McHugh. Remember, who is she? Rock star gallerist. So come on over with me. I'm gonna my here. Uh, this is the artwork that we're gonna look at. Get a close up look at that. I'm going to put a different mic on. Because I want you to hear me. So let's just have the chat, everyone. Can you put a little emoji or a thumbs up in that chat? 
if you can hear me okay. We got one shout out from Michael Moore already, Emma. What? Hey, Michael. Michael Moore, thank you very much. What emoji did you choose? Detective, popcorn, and cool guy with sunglasses. Right on. Michael Moore, did you know I was gonna look at this artwork? <laughs> Just kidding. So um, here we go. I've got my other mic on. I'm gonna check in with my friend Brian Sir and keep talking for a second before I begin to really look at this artwork. Now remember teachers, I have notes, pardon the rustling. The rustling of papers. I'll try to keep it at a minimum. How are we doing there, Brian? Okay. So I'm mic'd up to the max, and now I'm going to seriously look at this artwork by George C. Longfish. What I'm noticing first about this artwork is the composition or the arrangement of the elements in an artwork. What are those parts of the artwork arranged like? And for this one, I'm noticing it is a symmetrical composition. What is on one side is on the other side as well. And it looks a little bit different, but it's still a symmetrical composition nonetheless. So anytime you wish, please share with me what you see in the chat. And again, my friend Mallory Marsh will relay that to me. I got another one from Michael, Emma. Yes. Well, first you got you got two emojis from our friends out there, Monet being one of them. Perfect. Um, and I'm only going to say what Michael said because I said it to you the other day, that the color of your shirt in this gallery is everything. It's <gasps> perfect. Yes! My career as a rock star. Oh, <laughs> no. No, I do not compare myself to rock star Adelaide McHugh. 30 years as an established Art gallery, it's quite amazing. Now, you're gonna hear me talk about her throughout, um, and we'll learn more, a little bit more about her and why I think she's a rock star later. But let's continue on with this. So I am curious about the contrast between these two elements. On the left, I see a detailed drawing of a Native American. I'm digging these brilliant colors. The pattern is dynamic, and what? Holographic paper, guys. The artist used holographic paper in this mixed media piece. So continuing on, let's uh, look more, see what we can see. So I've said that I really enjoy this pattern and the colors on this side of this artwork. Now on the other side, on the opposite side, what do you see? Share in the chat, I'm gonna share what I see. On the opposite side, I see a silhouette of this same person and there is no detail on this other side. The background is very different. What do you see? I see a silhouette in a dismal, empty background, also words. The only good Indian is a dead Indian or an invisible one. I'm very curious also about this cute little baby smack dab in the center of this artwork. The baby makes me smile and at the same time, I'm disturbed by the words. Miss Mallory. We got Monet in the chat saying that it feels empty. I think that's the background. opposite side mm -hmm. feels empty. Whereas this side, take a look at the detail, the holographic paper. That holographic paper is showing some movement. Yes, Monet, I feel that, that emptiness. Let's look further. Waiting just a tiny bit for that chat to catch up. No worries if I don't respond or we don't see it, and we eventually will, and then we'll share your response. 
when I'm looking at artwork, I love to go with people because I always like to hear their um, responses and hear what they see. So uh, let's ponder further. Let's be serious investigators. Let's check out the label. So I can share with you that the uh, title of this piece is I is for informational and then in parentheses cultural transfer. I'm going to say that again. I is for informational and parentheses cultural transfer. Let's continue to look at the artwork. So after reading the title, I noticed the capital letter I. So follow that holographic paper around this Native American and I see the letter I and surrounding that another letter I with the red and the, the yellow coloring. I also see birds and butterflies in flight. I'm not sure if you could see that. They might be reading a little bit tiny for you. Something so great. Those birds, those butterflies, that horse, that ram, those are puffy stickers. Who knew that that was an art material? Well, this is exactly the kind of artwork that Adeliza McHugh was looking for. She wanted to work with artists who weren't terribly concerned about tradition or what centuries of art history was telling us is the way to go. They wanted to debunk tradition and what a way to make an artwork. Let's all use puffy stickers from now on and they're so tactile. That's my favorite thing about puffy stickers. Um, where are they placed? What is the reason for them? We don't know, but I want to point out to you that this little, little, little bird here is standing so still. And that's the side that Monica de la Cruz m mentioned to us was very empty, except look, there's a little bird. And then the butterflies in flight. We don't usually see a ram or a horse up in the air. We don't get the sense that they're flying, but those elements contribute to that idea to me that all is not well in the world on that side. Now, uh, I think this artist is a perfect fit for this exhibition. Uh, Adeliza McHugh is quoted as saying that she wants to see art with a kick. Uh, and this is certainly art with a kick. Let's look further. And again, if I've got anything in that chat, I want to acknowledge it. Anybody? Anybody at all? <laughs> I kid, guys. I can keep on going. I do hate to hear my own opinion and hear myself talk on and on. Uh, I don't usually do that, but that's okay. That's okay. I can keep going. All righty. At this point, I feel comfortable making assumptions. Um, I will tell you that when I've been looking at art with others, they will always see something that I don't or vice versa. But um, I want to say that it's okay to have a different interpretation of an artwork. Uh, you can have your own interpretation and through your different um, backgrounds and your different values, uh, it stands to reason that, that we're all going to share and see things differently. And that's all right in art. Uh, looking at the label, I see that the artist George C. Longfish has the two words, Seneca and slash Tuscarero in parentheses beside his name that is on the label. Uh, I understand that he is Native American now and his tribal affiliations are Seneca and Tuscarora. Tuscarora. And please let me know if I'm mispronouncing that. I try real hard to practice, but uh, it's, it's imperfect for me. I'm not a linguist kind of gal. Uh, now, what deductions can I make about this artwork? I'm ready to interpret it. I'm ready to take a stab at what I think it's about. Um, does anyone want to share in the chat or shall I go first? At any point in time as I'm talking, feel free 
to send a comment. Okay, guys, this piece for me is a representat representation of triumph, longevity, strength, and fortitude. Why? Because of this baby, smack dab in the middle of this piece. Let's look at this baby. Let's take a careful look. Um, the baby is sitting in this brilliantly colored and patterned carrier. Uh, I want to say that underneath this carrier is a strip of glittery holographic paper. And for me, that is acting like a throne for this baby. Um, look at this baby. The position of the arms. This baby is ready for anything. And gosh, if you've got shades, that means you're going out for an adventure all is well, and you're going to go out. And to me, this baby is saying, let's go. Now, I don't see his legs. We don't see his legs. But I'm imagining his legs are wiggling. And uh, the baby's excited. And I'm understanding this entire artwork to be a representation of this statement. Hey, this is what we are. Glorious, intelligent, vibrant. And on this side, it represents the attempt to eliminate us. The baby disrupts everything. The baby says, nah, we are still here. Mallory. Barbara's backing you up in the chat, Emma. She's saying it's the sunglasses that do it for her. This baby is on the move. Yep, Barbara, I'm there with you. And uh, it's all I can do to stay here and not get out of the museum and go cruising in my car with my sunglasses on. Because that's what I associate with adventure. I wonder, what do you guys associate with adventure? Say in the chat. At any time. Miss uh, Mallory is gonna just alert me that there's a comment in the chat and I will share. Uh, so I said that the baby is representing that kind of we are still here because it's a baby, it's a newborn, represents life, uh, very much a uh, beginning and very much um, that generational uh, existence. Uh, now, we are still here is actually a direct quote from an interview with George C. Longfish. And uh, that's quote was years ago, but honestly, these days, I hear it continually from the Native American community. Uh, that is the message to all of us. We are still here. Now, um, I want to introduce you to George C. Longfish. And before I do that, does anyone have a comment? Yes. We got Barbara again. She, she, to answer your questions, she said traveling. Traveling, mm -hmm. oh. And then Monet says when she sees the baby, it reminds her of when her grandparents tell her that she is the next generation and she needs to keep their traditions and culture alive. Thank you so much, Barbara and Monet. I love those comments. And I really enjoy the fact that you're making that connection to your personal life, your personal experience and your family with this artwork by George C. Longfish. Love it, thank you so much. Now I am going to introduce you to George C. Longfish. Um, my friend Halton is gonna bring up a slide. Slide one. Now George C. Longfish is a living artist currently reside, residing in Maine. He has three children two boys and a girl. And you know, when I learned that, I wondered, do you think that uh, this baby is a reproduction of a photograph of one of his children? I wonder. What do you think? Now in this slide, um, I'm thinking you can see and yes, thumbs up. So here he is. This is George C. Longfish. Uh, I want to say maybe 40-ish years ago. Here he is, uh, self-defined and representing himself as the opposite 
of the stereotypes of Native Americans. Uh, on the, on the um, print, you can see the words 20th century, tribal, Seneca, warrior, artist, and healer. So when I first saw this triptych, this is actually the first panel on a triptych, and a triptych is an artwork with three panels. And uh, the panels are uh, compositionally connected. Uh, they are uh, meant to be read or understood as um, one communication to the viewer. Uh, when I first saw this, I thought to myself, now what would I, what words would I use to define myself, I wonder? Uh, and I asked that of you. So we all take our selfies and, and I don't know, sometimes the background is the focal point, but here, uh, George C. Longfish, there he is. Um, he's known for using uh, words in his artwork, as you can see by this artwork that we were looking at, and then now by his, oops, let me take off my shades, guys. There we go. And you can see by this self-portrait. Let me tell you a little bit more about George C. Longfish. Now, he is collected by many important museums, including the Smithsonian and the Crocker. Now, for 30 years, he was professor of historical and contemporary Native American art at UC Davis. And there is a Native American museum at UC Davis. He was the director for 22 years. And in fact, um, C.N. Gorman, the founder of that museum, recruited George C. Longfish to take over for him when he retired. And so he was the second director of this museum. And 20 years, 22 years is a long time. So guys, he's um, credited for influencing and mentoring so many artists artists who are successful and have gone on to uh, establish their own noteworthy careers. And, and I'm just um, very much in awe of George C. Longfish. He's also a scholar and he's written several essays about the negative stereotypes of Native Americans. Now most of his artwork, his aesthetic is uh, definitely luscious and uh, colorful. His uh, imagery that he combines with this mixed media artwork, a painting, a print, he's very, very accomplished in many different mediums. And um, so he will often use stenciled, stenciled, stenciled text and he'll include images of Native Americans, very, very humorous. Um, he's influenced by what uh, tech, uh, a type of artwork called abstract expressionism, which is just another type of abstract art. Uh, so I wanna say the most famous abstract expressionist would be Jackson Pollock. But that speaks to all the different techniques that you'll find in abstract expressionism. I really enjoy uh, presenting this type of art to people that come to the museum, because I really like to hear my kindergartner can do that. <laughs> And uh, of course, I'm talking about that idea of what is this meaning of splashes? What is this meaning of all of these scribbles? What is this meaning of puffy stickers? Why would I use puffy stickers in an artwork? Well, all of these kinds of things appeal to Adeliza McHugh. But um, now that we've met George C. Longfish, we know a little bit about his background. So what do you make of this artwork? Let's take another look at it. After learning about this artist, did your opinion about the artwork change at all? If it did, share in the chat, or if you have a comment, feel free to include that. Now, George C. Fush, his early life, he uh, was actually born in the six, on the Six Nations Reservation in Canada. Now, when he was five years old, he attended the Thomas Indian School, and, and we have a picture of the school for you. Five years old, guys. So born on the reservation. Slide two. Born on the reservation. Uh, five years old. He and his younger brother 
they were taken to the school. The mother, uh, what he says about it, um, his mother was a single mom and he understood why this happened. And then of course, the times, it was uh, the thing to do. Uh, and this had to do with the assimilation of Native Americans. There's a long history of it. And if you can uh, look it up and learn a little bit about it, I would highly encourage you to do so. So uh, I got this picture or the slide that you're looking at from the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Now, however way they got it, I don't know, but they have a remarkable collection of 85 glass negatives depicting life at the Thomas Indian School. It is fascinating. Take a look when you get a chance. Of this time period in his life, he says, I was denied my culture. Prior to my getting to the school, the students could speak their language. I resent not getting to know my own language, but I did get my, back my culture in other ways. So this school, it closed when uh, George C. Longfish was 14, and at that time, he went to Chicago to reunite with his mother. So here he is in Chicago, and it's not surprising that his interest in art was nurtured and began to grow. Uh, Chicago has many museums. It's a vibrant and art and cultural com community. Uh, when I think about the co quote uh, that he said about uh, not being denied his culture, it is remarkable to me that Longfish had this illustrious career and became an advocate for Native Americans um, after having no knowledge at all of this culture and his own culture. He came back to it. It's a mark remarkable achievement and it's, it's a triumph. So um, slide four, I did want to share this with you. It's a quote from George C. Longfish. Um, and he's telling us that's up to the viewer to decide. Uh, remember that I said to you that when you look at an artwork with somebody, they might see something different from you, and you might have two completely different interpretations of that artwork. There's not a wrong or a right answer there. And I hear this many times from the artists that I work here, with here at the museum. They say that that's up to the viewer to decide. Um, now, we spent some significant time looking at George C. Longfish's artwork, and uh, we were kind of decoding it in a way. So is it some kind of big relief to know that George C. Longfish is okay with you making up your own decision about what the artwork is about? I think it's a big relief, and it allows us to have a lot of fun. So I want to show you um, a close-up of this artwork that we're looking at. Uh, and I want to note that this artwork I is for um, boo, 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 informational culture in parentheses transfer is a piece that is in the Crocker's collection. This is our artwork. It is an artwork that is a part of a series. A series being uh, several artworks that are similar in the, what they're communicating and what their composition is or the colors or the subject matter. And um, so we have another artwork, slide six. Take a look and you're gonna see I is for Indian. <coughs> also exists here. We're going to see a symmetrical composition. And then another one in the series. Then we're going to keep right on going to the next slide. And this one is not the series, it's an artwork called Spirit. This artwork uh, is depicting Pawnee Chief Petalasharo 
and please correct me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, Pani Chief Pelasharo. It means chief of men or man chief. And on the side of this uh, slide, of the slide of the image, on the side of the image, I'm going to read to you. It says, I sat down and meditated. I got into a clear space. I met him. We kind of talked. We came to an agreement. He said, and in less than two days, it had, he, I had it totally done. It was incredible. And here he, was, he is referring to his difficulty in drawing Chief Petalishura. And he's talking about how he overcame it. So he went into a meditative state, uh, and this is his process with many of his artworks. Uh, and then the referencing, uh, talking to Chief Pelashoro, uh, he's referencing that idea of soul theft. If you have the image of me, you have my soul. And that is what uh, George C. Longfish is referring to. So checking in with the chat, anybody have any comments, any thoughts to share? Okay, let's uh, close with a quote from George C. Longfish, and, and this uh, might sum up what we've been doing for the last, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and I'll read it and you read along. Historically, many of the images of Native American life have been distorted and documented with prejudice. The images I create are meant to question the stereotypical romantic image of Native American people so port often portrayed in the past as well as current media. Do uh, Google uh, George C. Longfish and learn more. He has so many important things to say. Um, I love the idea that um, George C. Longfish worked with Adeliza. I think that uh, he's perfect fit for the kind of work that Adeliza wanted to represent and show and be affiliated with. Uh, and that's another reason that she's a rock star. She was not afraid. She was very daring. And though the message here in this artwork uh, may have uh, been a little bit uh, empty as a Monica Thea, observed and it may not have been happy it is still important to note uh, as you can see i'm getting ready to discard my little throne and understanding which mic i'm going to discard i've taken off my glasses but i'm going to be on the move being irreverent or they were not concerned at all about tradition. What they wanted to do was do work that they felt was important to them. And if you didn't like it, that was okay with them. So come on over. I see Kilahuli, Roya Forest, all artists that everyone is and here we go with Robert Artisan. So I mentioned that Eliza McHugh was a rock star gallerist. And another reason that I think that she was a rock star gallerist is she did not have a background in art. Uh, she wasn't an artist herself, but uh, she had a knack for selling and how she spoke about it, uh, how she portrayed the significance of an artwork to someone that she was hoping would pay money for it. I don't know, but she was very successful. And look at the kind of artwork that she was selling. It wasn't artwork that was easy to look at. Here's Robert Artisan. Yeah, there's portraits through the centuries. But Robert Arneson said, oh, yes, I'm going to make a self-portrait, and I'm going to make it pick in my nose. So he's definitely developing tradition, and he would definitely attract the eye of Adeliza McKean. Now, um, 
Robert Larson and many of these artists who are represented in this gallery, they were uh, professors or teachers at UC Davis. Um, some of them uh, taught at Sac State. Uh, Sac State has a wonderful exhibit of uh, artists who were represented by the candy stores in their library gallery. So check that one out too. Okay, let's look at more art. I think I want to go to this one, Hampton. This one, I've been hearing very, very, very softly. So come on. Oh, and then settling. So this is an artwork by Clayton Bailey. I don't know why I'm being more quiet. I think it's because when I go in this gallery, I kind of play a little game, and I try to predict when the glove is going to happen. I'm going to be quiet this time so you can hear it. I could, I'm sorry, I could just stay here all day. <laughs> Clay Bailey, dangerous brain mold. Oh my God, it's so dangerous. Look, there's a syringe. There's a syringe, oh, and what is that brown stuff? Come on now, come on chat people. What are you looking at? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? So what is this, is this, oh, look. You know what? At first I thought this was a lizard, but that's a freaking vein, you guys. Oh. Dangerous brain bowl. started on puns. I love puns. Oh my goodness. Let's take a look at David Gill Cooley's sculpture. What are you seeing here? Okay, it's a moon. You see the moon? It's a moon. Stick a fork in it. It's a pie. Moon. And not only that, do you remember when we said Otherwise and the Cube was attractive, this kind of artwork? It's off the beaten path. It's funny and punny. And look at this. What has he done to this moon pie? The moon pie's on a pedestal. Now in art history, what we put on the pedestal are monumental figures, but not David Gilhooly. He's going to put a moon pie on a pest. And not only that, this half of the moon pie is chocolate. I'm guessing vanilla. But actually, actually, guys, you can eat a moon pie. They come in a little box. They're terribly unhealthy for you. But they're not shaped like this. They're like round and they're filled with this cream and so on. And they're all, they're called moon pies, but I like David Kilhooly's moon pie so much better. So now I'm distracted. Let me look at my notes. Where do I go next? This is a pun, you guys. I love puns. There's a game that you can play. Uh, you gather some items in your house and you put them together and you have your friend or family member guess what it is and you make a pun that way. Yes, Mallory. Oh, I just uh, got a little info in the chat. Monet says it's very unique. 
And then Lori is commenting that many of these artists were her teachers. <gasps> Lori, how lucky were you? Did you laugh like crazy all the time? Did they surprise you? I would just be cracking up. I'm just standing in this gallery. We could go to every artwork. We would see art with a kick, exactly as uh, described by the title of the exhibition. So now I'm going to go over um, more about Adelaide in the queue. You know, another reason she's a rock star, I said she was daring and a very, very unique person. She actually did not know any artists. She didn't know any artists at all. Now, um, when we talk about Adelaide and the Q, we have to mention Irving Marcus. Now, Irving Marcus, um, he had an artwork that was in a Kingsley, and the Kingsley is an art club that has been in existence for many years. Uh, I know many of the members, they're just remarkable art fiends like me. Now, Irving Marcus uh, was also the department chair at Sac State. So Eliza saw this artwork in this exhibit. It was here at the Crocker when it was the E.B. Crocker Art Gallery. And just out of the blue, she called Irving Marcus and she said, how about you show in my gallery? Well, keep in mind at this time, Eliza McHugh did not have any artwork in her gallery. It was a thought in her head. Look, the candy gig didn't work out. I'm gonna show and sell art. And she chose this artist, Irving Marcus, and he was, I say was, pardon me if I get a little bit emotional, uh, Marcus, Irving Marcus passed away last year. I am going to miss going to his openings and seeing him and his lovely wife, Elizabeth, uh, surrounded by their friends and uh, every time I went to uh, an exhibit of his in a gallery, it was always so full of color. Uh, his imagery, um, always enough to just uh, keep you with it for a while, thinking about it and pondering it. And again, another a perfect example of the kind of aesthetic that Adelaide and the Q was really desiring for her art gallery. And honestly, I do believe, I mean, I didn't know her. I'm a little too young to have had a personal experience with the candy, uh, with, with, excuse me, candy store gallery. Uh, I would imagine that through all of her 30 years, she was consistent in looking for artists who were doing something new, something unusual, and they didn't really mind if you didn't like their artwork. They were doing their thing for sure. Now, um, Eric Marcus is the very, was the very first artist who showed in, uh, in Candy Store Gallery. Uh, and he's a generous, generous man. He was a generous man. And he introduced her to uh, many artists and thus began Candy Store Gallery and Adeliza McHugh's brand new career as a gallerist. And rock star gallerist at that, don't forget. Now, I had a very, very memorable experience with Irving Marcus. As a museum educator here at the museum, I work with many artists, and uh, I, uh, I enjoy it very much. So Irving Marcus was asked to create an art activity for an exhibit that we have. And in this program, it's typical of our programs where the public is invited to join in in the art activity. Uh, and then they uh, might look at an artwork that is associated with the activity. But what I want to do today right now is share that activity with you and maybe you could try it sometime. Uh, it's very enjoyable. You're not going to draw a thing that's recognizable, so don't be scared. Now, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go over here. Uh, and what I have used, or actually what Early markets wanted to use for this activity is very simple materials. He wanted to use oil, pastel, and paper. Part of the noise here. I don't know if my mic is picking that up. Can I get someone to mention what's going on? 
with this stuff in the chat? Everything okay? All right, so here's the art project. And uh, we're going to put shapes on a piece of paper with our oil pastels. But there's a particular way to do it. Now, with these programs, we actually practice. The staff and the artists practice. So when I was practicing with Irving Marcus, and he was walking me through this activity. First of all, the uh, oil pastels were in boxes like this. And they looked kind of new, kind of like this. And everything looked at it, and all the papers were so neat, and I, I very, very carefully, you know, so tidy, and putting paper towels beside the oil pastels so people could wash their hands. And the first thing Irving asked me to do was break some of them in half and peel off the paper. I said, okay, you're Irving Marcus. I'm a fan. I'm going to break this stuff up and peel off the paper. And then it made sense to me later. Uh, and then he started walking me through the uh, art activity. Uh, and he sensed my hesitation in selecting colors. Uh, and he said to me this great thing, and it just changed how I approach materials altogether. Uh, he saw me hesitating and he said, Emma, don't be afraid of color. And uh, I took that to heart. I'm still afraid of color, but less so. How's that? So here's the activity. So take your uh, box of colors, whatever they are. I like the oil pastels, but you don't have to use them. I'm going to select a color. And if you can see my colors and you want to select the second one, go right ahead. You're going to start with just putting down, laying a shape. I'm just going to do the square, put that aside, and now I have to select a second color to lay beside this. But before I do that, I'm going to ask myself questions about this color. And you can answer them in the chat. Does this color have a temperature for you? Does it make you feel warm? Does it make you feel cool? Are you enjoying this color? Is this color dark or light? Now, it's going to get complicated. I'm going to choose another color. I think I'll choose this one. I'm going to put that beside it. I'm not going to go over it. I'm just going to put it beside it. And now I'm going to try and understand the relationship between these two colors. So as I look at these two colors, and that's part of what you want to do, you want to look at these two colors and ask yourself this question. Does this black color look more brilliant or brighter now that I've put this color beside it? Do these colors look appealing to each other? Now I'm going to pick a third color. Which color should I pick? Orange, somebody said? <laughs> Let's do orange now. So this time around, you've got your third color. Make sure your third color touches the other two. I had a little bit of overlap there, but that's okay. Now it's getting more complicated. Now you've got these three colors. Do they look appealing together? Together, do they give you a feeling of warmth, coolness? Is this more appealing than this? Now it's going to get even more complicated because we're going to add a fourth color. We got someone choose. in the chat. Yes. Can we do purple? Ta da! Ta -da. You and Monet are on the same wavelength. We page. are on the same wavelength. Now, another question. Now, where should I put this color? Up here? Up here? Or here? Any one of these choices, putting them beside two colors, is going to make a difference in how this looks and how I feel about these colors. Anybody? Here.
And I'm still asking myself all these questions. How am I responding to the way these three colors appear together? Are they more brilliant? Do they dull each other? Now I'm going to do something, and I'm sorry, Mallory, I know that these are your pastels, but I'm going to break it. Sorry. Read Irving Marcus. And peeling. So this just seems so simple, but what Irving Marcus told people to do was make the marks with the tip. Make the marks with the angle. And then this is my favorite part, making the marks with the side. So tip would be like this, right? Can you see that? Let me turn this. So tip would be like this. Angle would be like this. Watch this. I love this. Ah, let me hold it. Look at how much area I've covered. So let me lay down oh, and look at Mallory's oil pastels. It's kind of gone. It has been eaten by the paper. I'm going to go in with orange. And I'm not going to rip the paper off in the interest of time. But I'm going to do this thing here. Oh, look, it overlapped a little bit. And it's not very pleasant looking to me. But if I need a brown, how do I make it? How do I make it? Say it out loud, sitting in your chair or wherever you are. If I want brown, blue and orange, it'll get you every time. So I'm gonna take my red. This is something else that Urban Marcus wanted us to do. He said really, really smush that color in there. You know what I'm going for, guys? This is called intensity. This color is gonna be intense versus this. Not so intense, but this. Very intense. This is another thing that Irving Marcus wanted us to do. He wanted us to get in there with our fingers and blend. What's going on here, people? In the chat, what's going on? Then he also wanted us to take the white and anywhere you like, put it on top of a color. I'm going to put it on top of this color that I just made. What's going on, guys? And I'm going to smear that again. And what do I have? Red book plus blue is purple. I add a little bit of white, and it's a little lighter purple. What do you think of this art project by Irving Marcus? This is a great way to be comfortable with color. It's a great way to get to know color. It's a great way to get to know the relationship of color to each other. And, you know, even if you're not going to make a painting or a print or an oil or, or a collage, understanding color and what it means to you personally, it'll translate for others. Noticed here that Urban Marcus used red and green next to each other. Those are complementary colors, and they are known to make each other brighter when they're next to each other. Many, many artists use complementary colors in their artwork. Now, we've talked about a lot of art. We've looked at a lot of art. We've understood why Adeliza McHugh was a rock star gallerist. So it's a lot of information, but two things I would love for you to remember. What does George C. Longfish want us to know about his people? We are still here. And what can we learn from Irving Marcus? Don't be afraid of color. And let's stretch arms up in the air. One arm here, one arm here, and scene. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody have a great day.